This was a difficult talk to make because having only five minutes for the book was really uh, uh, something. But uh, in case I don't make it through the end of my slide, you can find already the slide on my website, which is with rare efficiency was uh, prepared this morning. Um, this is the title. This is the look and feel of the book. We will discuss how we have a few copies with us, and Angela maybe will say something on how and if we can distribute some of them. But all of you are encouraged to purchase it on Amazon because it doesn't cost much. Now it's only six uh, and a half euros. We made a great effort to make sure that this book didn't have the outrageous prices you find for books in general. And Dan Sarevi, sitting here in the first row, was very instrumental in helping us to, to get this done. And he wrote, also wrote a very nice um, uh, foreword to our work. Uh, it's nice to have friends, because when you have friends, they are willing to write nice things about you. And here you have a couple of blurbs uh, um, written on the books. Uh, and uh, uh, Philip Starks, uh, who teaches statistics at Berkeley, was particularly um, uh, 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 excited about our book and talks about penetrating, frightening, provocative, irrefutable even, which I think we are not, but anyhow. And, and Jack, Jack Stilgoy, which is maybe here in the room, yeah, he's there. Uh, he says something very important, that though we, in a sense, uh, bring forward a critique, we are also sympathetic to our subject, like in the famous movie uh, uh, Women on the Border of Nervous Breakdown, which gives the title to the, to the book, though not all of you may have seen this movie by Pedro Almodovar. Okay, so I have short time, so I will talk only about the crisis. I will focus on that. Uh, this is a very recent article by two people who have thought hard about the crisis in reproducibility, reproducibility Begley and Ioannidis. They say, okay, we are producing uh, science at uh, an accelerated pace, but many of these discoveries, some people have said maybe 80 or 90 percent even, could be non-reproducible. Uh, and this may be due to a number of combination, uh, sloppy practices and wrong system of incentive. This is a general problem. No single party is responsible. The issue is complicated. The solution will likewise be complicated. Here is some more uh, stories about uh, how this came about. Uh, this was found in uh, organic chemistry. Uh, orga organic chemists found out that they could not trust the number of yield of chemical products uh, which were published. In preclinical cancer trial, this was very painful because discovering that a preclinical cancer trial was somehow sloppy or doctored means that you risk your life if you're given the treatment and you are a terminal patient. So the implication of sloppy science are really something uh, staggering of the last, this lack of reproducibility. And this also has huge implication on the funding of research, a topic I mentioned but I don't venture into. Uh, if you want to have a date when the clock starts ticking more furiously, this could be October 2013 when the economy splash on the cover this story, how science goes wrong, trouble at the lab, reproducibility, using very strong language to say that we're not happy at all with the news they were receiving from the House of Science. Uh, already they have this first hint that the issue is not only statistical and methodological, but also linked to normatives. Brian Nozick, who is the person we will meet in the next slide, says that there is not a price in getting things wrong, but the cost is not getting them published. So we have this clear issue of the incentive. And he's one of those who fought to see that not only in the field of natural science and medical sciences, but even and maybe foremost in the field of economics and the field of social sciences, including behavioral scientists, there were really huge problems. In fact, this Kahneman, who was a famous uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, but a cognitive psychologist. Uh, he, he, thank you. He, he made. A, 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 he was one of the first to say that he saw big trouble coming about in the field of behavioral study. Uh, I won't mention the subject because I don't have the time in 10 minutes. Uh, now this is very recent. This is a few days ago. As usual, I got this from uh, the... Uh, I'm uh, subscribing to the uh, Silvio Post. Uh, Silvio Post is, is a mail which arrives every day and brings you news from the battlefront. And from the battlefront, I uh, get this. <coughs> uh, Belinda Phipps, who said some very courageous word about what's happening with science. Uh, complacency. Public trusted scientists only because they did not understand their work. I subscribe to this entirely. I'm a scientist. I speak for myself, of course. Um, 
And she goes on to say that what strikes her is that uh, how a little uh, punishment is involved in getting things wrong in science. Uh, I myself got things wrong in science more than once in my professional career. Um, and, and they say that there should be something similar to the uh, Hippocratic heart of doctors or some way to, to improve things uh, from the present status. Uh, I unfortunately don't have time to speak about economics, but in the field of economics, this is the same story on steroids. Uh, many solutions have been thought and discussed from within. Uh, I don't have time to go through them all, but there is an a interesting uh, checklist in, uh, in the Declaration of San Francisco, which you'll find on the web. Uh, recently, uh, Ioannidis published a paper with, uh, again, a declaration of uh, a list of possible remedies, uh, uh, which are uh, double sided on one hand methodological and on the other hand motivational. Um, it includes also an important element of training. And, uh, but what uh, the core of my speech today, which is the answer to the question of those who say, are you really sure that there is a crisis, is here. We can only understand that there is a crisis if we understand the root causes. And we can only have a diagnosis if we understand the root causes. I will, kill, uh, I will uh, kick out a few here. Uh, one prediction of the crisis was already in the 60s by um, Derek de Sola Price, which said science is growing so quickly that this is going to have some consequences. Either it stops growing so quickly, or something will happen, or eventually science will reach senility under its own weight. This is a word you use, senility. And we could discuss a lot about that, and I could discuss it with you maybe over coffee, what this senility might uh, take, what, what aspect this senility might take. A number of scholars, one of which is sitting here with us, made a very accurate prediction, and I'm talking about uh, Lyotard and uh, and, and, and Ravitz, but Ravitz got there first, Jerry, uh, and, and the diagnosis of the crisis, which is contained in the book written by Jerry in 1971, is really fulminating, is really on the point, spot on. Pity the book is 450 pages long, but is a, a, a very enjoyable reading, so I <laughs> encourage you to go through it, uh, but uh, otherwise I can provide you with excerpts from where the crisis was uh, predicted. Lyotard, you all know, postmodern, he said the uh, legitimacy of uh, uh, science is questioned when science becomes from normal science, little science, to big science, techno science, and so on. And Mirovsky, who is not predicting, Mirovsky is more describing, because this book is written in 2011, he said, he described painfully in the details how things went about when science became market science. So when this market took care of the quality of the science, you know, the, the hell broke loose. Um, I have only one, one maybe slide from the many of I would like to quote from, from the book of Jerry, but they are only in the book, uh, which we just published. And he said, the problem of quality control is the core of the problem. Because quality control depends on a set of delica delicate equilibria, which are very much sewed into the social fabric of science. In the moment in which these social fabrics is totally changed, by new things happening. So science becoming an instrument of growth and an instrument of profit as opposed to an instrument of building, an instrument of self-emancipation, then things may really get uh, us into serious uh, trouble. So we have now different reading of the crisis, uh, poor training, statistical design, hubris of data mining, we search for too many effects, we don't find enough. Then we have the incentive side, then we have the De Sola uh, Prize Vision, which is more recently also endorsed by uh, another scholar I like a lot, which is uh, uh, Milgram, Elia Milgram, science victim of his own success. Uh, Mirovsky reading as science as a victim of neoliberal ideology. This wouldn't surprise you for those who know Mirovsky. And science as a social enterprise whose quality control uh, suffers under mutated ethical condition, which is the reading, I think, not because the other are wrong. All these readings are accurate. All these readings are there, but this is the core of the matter and which helps to understand why the crisis we have today is real. Uh, um, and, and, and the second point I would like to do, how am I doing with the time? Oh, one, minute. one minute. Okay, so I must really quick. This, the impact of the crisis on science for policy is totally ignored. Seeing here today with us, you may have the impression that this is not the case. Don't be fooled. I mean, there are really a huge universe outside uh, in the field of science for policy who choose not to register that there is a crisis of quality in science. 
And they have many good reasons for doing this. They don't want to engender funding of research. They don't want to, um, uh, to, to make uh, the, the science advice more vulnerable, so they want to protect all these things. But they prefer not to register it. And I think th they should register it, because uh, there are, uh, um, uh, what, is it a minute? Yes, I, I can make it a minute. Uh, well, this is a paper from, from Dan here, where he makes very cleverly the connection. Uh, oh, blah. Now it's me, now it's me. My own, my own device betrayed me. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I think this is my, my last slide, so I will stay in the time. There is a very delicate um, mechanism of, um, uh, of proof, which uh, for science for policy very often relies on statistical and mathematical modeling. I cannot say much more on that. This is precisely where the challenge of quality is the highest. Uh, uh, let me make you, with you a thought experiment. If the, uh, what happened with Volkswagen had to do with hardware rather than software, so if it was not a software to set up the engine so that it would respond so and so, if this had to be a hole or a valve, would this have happened? Hmm? So this gives you only an idea of why it's so crucial that our modeling, our programming, our statistical software, all these, you know, is, is, uh, is so vulnerable, and why you cannot uncouple the crisis in science qua science and the crisis in science advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm.